Hello, Minnesota. Welcome back to the Tony Hernandez Show, and happy Cinco de Mayo. It's a beautiful day in Minnesota. I don't know if you guys noticed that big, bright orange thing uh, shining in the sky, but that's the sun, and it, it feels good. And I spent the day today uh, with my son, Maximilian. We were at the Cinco de Mayo Festival on the west side of St. Paul. There was a ton of people there. Uh, and I encourage everyone to go. I think it goes on uh, for a few more hours. So the Cinco de Mayo uh, Festival was a great time. I'll, I'll show you a picture here. Dallas, if you can uh, throw up my uh, Facebook page here. There's uh, me and my son, uh, Maximilian. We uh, enjoyed the time together. Uh, he saw Parade. He loves listening to the drums. And uh, he just had a good time. I also gave him some pork on a stick. And he just started gnawing it. And uh, one more little update with uh, the son here. I uh, wanted to show you this, this cool video. Uh, he actually took his, his first crawls here. So we're going to watch this. Uh, I called it uh, One Small Crawl for Maximilian. It just made uh, Leon and I so happy to see him make this progress. So we'll watch this quickly. Boy. There he Yay. is, He's going for the computer. That's uh, either computers or iPhones. That's uh, that's what's going to get uh, Maximilian off his uh, getting them moving. So I just want to thank everybody for uh, tuning into the show. Once again, we broadcast live every Saturday from 4 o'clock to 5 o'clock on SCC Television Studios right here in White Bear Lake. We also play in Maplewood and uh, uh, PNN. In St. Paul, they also broadcast us live, so we reach all of the St. Paul audience. And, of course, you can always watch uh, rebroadcasts on our YouTube channel, which is Tony Hernandez Show. Uh, we got a great show today. I'm honored to be able to say that we have Representative Pam Myra uh, here on the studio to introduce you all to her. And she's also the lieutenant governor candidate to... Uh, Marty Seifert's campaign for governor. So we're going to learn a whole lot about her and about the campaign and uh, some of the stances that she's taken. Uh, but before we do, we're going to uh, play a, a video here. And uh, for all of you who want to take part, uh, this is for the Liberty Gala. And it's a Republican event that's going to be held. And we're going to watch the video here just so people can get a better idea. So Dallas, if we can line that up. That's the uh, Liberty Gala event that's going to be held by the CD4 and CD5 Republicans. Encourage everybody to go to that website, libertygala.com, sign up for the event. Looks like it should uh, be a good one. And uh, with that, I want to uh, bring on our guest today, Representative Pam Myra. Pam, thank you for uh, coming on the you show. Bet. I'm very glad to be here. Thank you, Tony. It's a true uh, honor to have you on the show here. Um, I remember we met, uh, I think it was in 2010, and, okay. and it was at a, a MEPS event, and you were a candidate then, and yes. you went on to win the election in 2010. My very and first one. Also went on to win re-election in 2012, yes. which was a, a very difficult and challenging year for mm -hmm. Republicans, and, and you managed to pull off a victory for re-election. So it must say something about the, the trust that you've earned uh, with 
the public and, and the voters in your district. So congratulations well, Thank on you that. very much. And, and that election I won with 54% of the vote, so I was very excited with, about that. That's incredible. That's incredible. And again, congratulations for being selected to be Marty Seifert's running mate. Uh, it's a great honor. And can you just tell everyone about how the campaign's going so far? Well, it's going very well. It seems like every day there's good news. Uh, supporters, people coming up to me and uh, sharing that uh, they they are giving us their full support and uh, good polls coming out every other week and uh, very, very pleased to be on the ticket. Nice. I wanted to, to let everyone know a, a little bit because you were a first time candidate in 2010 and you yes. went on to win, uh, which is a remarkable achievement in and of mm -hmm. itself. And, you know, I mentioned that I'd met you at a, a MEPS event. Mm -hmm. And uh, can you talk about what MEPS is and the role that it played in your victory and, and continues to play? Sure. Uh, MEPS is Minnesota Excellence in Public Service. It is an organization that provides uh, communication, leadership, and man management training for women. And I had decided to run, uh, and uh, Janet Byhofer suggested that I participate in this uh, fellowship, and it had um, it was wonderful. Uh, there was a sounding board, um, a place to ask questions. Um, it was camaraderie with other women uh, as we were trying to win our races and and serve the public. Well, it's really Meps, good. Meps must be doing something right because if you look at the people who have gone through uh, this program, uh, we mentioned some of the names. Uh, Representative Andrea Kiefer, yes. uh, she came from that program. Kathy Lomer. Representative Lomer, who's an incredible representative, she uh, came out of that program. Connie Depke. Connie Depke. And yes, Diane Anderson was also uh, a MEPS fellow. So yes, there have been ma very many and also campaign managers have come out of the program and um, it really empowers women to uh, help out in grassroots efforts uh, for conservative causes. Yeah, I think, uh, did Ann knew? Uh, yes, she participated the same year that I was in it. Yeah, so Ann, she went through the MEPS program and then she went on to be the manager for uh, Congressman Chip yes. Kravak's successful she campaign. She did a and wonderful the, job on that. She must have, uh, the, this program must do something of wonders in terms of giving people the, the skills and the knowledge to run successful campaigns and then also represent the people after yes. they win. Right, and uh, it, they bring in wonderful speakers like yourself and uh, allows opportunities to ask questions and learn a lot. Um, it, it was really wonderful. Well, I want to get into uh, more about the, the Cypher campaign and, right. and your bid for lieutenant governor. But before we do, we have a lot of young people and, right. and people across St. Paul and the Metro that tune into this show. And when we bring candidates on, uh, we, we like to find out kind of the why and the hows in terms of running because you know there's a lot of uh, young women out there and mm -hmm. young men out there who who maybe think that they want to hold some type of an office someday whether it's running for their local community boards or school boards or mm -hmm. run for the state legislator uh, you know what sort of advice do you have to uh, offer some of those people who who may be thinking about running for office someday or maybe sometime soon as far as advice, I would say it's so important to be willing to listen. Uh, as candidates and legislators, usually people just like to talk. They don't like to listen to what other people have to say. Mm. And I think it's really important to key in to find out what people's concerns are. I was at a, an event a couple weeks ago and uh, I asked a person, what do you really care about? Why are you involved in uh, what keeps you up at night? And he shared with me, and, and we get, kept getting interrupted, but I kept coming back and asking him that question. After the evening was over, he said, no candidate, no legislator has ever asked him that. Hmm. And I think it's really important for uh, leaders to listen to constituents and what their concerns are. I think um, in the legislature, what's really important is to show respect, is to um, have respect, even for somebody who you don't agree with, uh, to find out what it is that is their goal and sometimes our goals are not too far off we get at them differently uh, but showing respect I think is a very good place to start uh, in the legislature uh, I've had the opportunity to chief author four bills uh, two in the first um, my first term and two in my second term that were unanimously approved in the house and uh, signed into law by the governor and I think uh, it was crucial 
to uh, be showing respect to people. And uh, sometimes they'd come up to me either in um, the halls of, of the state office building or the uh, Capitol or in committee and express concerns about my bill. And uh, just sitting down with them, working through it, and uh, negotiating and, and um, compromising the language and dealing with the issues that they had uh, allowed me to get them on board and eventually uh, have unanimous bills. Hmm. Nice. And, you know, what was the fact, how did you decide that you wanted to run? Was it like an aha mm -hmm. moment where all of a sudden you decided, hey, I want to be the next state representative? Or what were, what were the... What was the groundwork for you making that big decision? Uh, thank you for that question. In fact, that question was asked of me uh, when I had a day at the Capitol in my first term. Um, I invited the community to come in, and um, it was a, a wonderfully attended event. And a gentleman was there, and he said, uh, Representative Myra, would you please explain how and why a stay-at-home mom runs for office against a strong incumbent and wins. And I shared two uh, personal stories that were really uh, important to me. One is foundational for how I live my life. I, I spent five of my first six years of life in Latin America. Hmm. And I came back to the United States. What, what country were you living in now? Uh, one year was in Costa Rica, where my parents learned to speak Spanish. And four of the years uh, were in Bolivia, South America, where my parents were missionaries. They, uh, my dad planted um, churches, and uh, also they were administrators for uh, a boys' orphanage there. We came back to the United States when I was six years old, and obviously my first language was Spanish. And I really struggled in school. Uh, it was very difficult for me to read. I was uh, bullied. Um, hmm. We could talk about that issue later on, but uh, both physically and verbally uh, uh, abused. And in fact, in fourth grade, my teacher dealt with my illiteracy by having me sit next to the smart kids in class and uh, instructed me to get answers from them. Hmm. Well, under that kind of teaching for an entire year, I entered fifth grade with nil reading skills. That year changed my life. I had an um, uh, amazing teacher, and she taught me to read. She took me from nil reading skills all the way to fifth grade, ninth month. It completely transformed my life. Uh, those earlier years in grade school, I was an utter failure, and I knew it. I knew it. Her teaching me to read opened a door of opportunity for me, uh, and I've not looked back. Uh, it's, um, it's been a wonderful experience. I learned three things through uh, that foundational time in my life. I learned, one, that uh, God loves me, and he answers prayer. Mm. Two, it's a I, big lesson to learn. It right was there. a big lesson. Uh, second, I learned the importance of working very hard and uh, persevering. Uh, when uh, you are faced with challenges. And third, I also learned that there's always hope. It was very desperate in those four mm -hmm. years. Even though I was a child, mm -hmm. I knew how hard I was struggling. I knew I was an utter failure, uh, but there was hope. And um, statistically, usually if a child fails two years in a row, there is you know, very difficult for them to get out of that. Mm -hmm. It was four years that I, I struggled. Wow. Uh, but um, it was a, an incredible experience. I gained five years of reading growth. The average in the class was two and a half years, and everybody gained more than one year. It was a brand new program for my school. It was offered that year when I was a fifth grader. But amazingly, it was canceled and the teacher was let go. My beloved Miss Keller uh, hmm. was let go. And so uh, it, that was a transforming experience in my life. Uh, the other personal story that I shared mm -hmm. with that constituent when he wanted to know why I would run is um, my husband and I have three children. We had our children, we were kind of later in life. And um, when my daughter received her first bicycle, we wanted to be sure that she was safe. And so we got her a helmet, we got training wheels, we gave her all the rules of the road. In fact, we made up some rules of our own. And uh, my husband got her braces for her wrists and for her, uh, for her knees. And off she went and she learned how to balance. And about two weeks into it, um, she called out to me with the most cheerful voice, Mommy, Mommy, I can drive just like you. 
I looked up from my gardening to see my daughter, and she had only one finger on the middle of her handlebars, and she's waving to me as she's racing by. <laughs> and I said, honey, no, you've got to use two hands. A couple days later, I'm driving down the road, and I look in my lap just briefly, and I've only got one finger on the bottom of my steering wheel. Now, it might seem like nothing, but it was an aha moment for me. It was that I can't just say what I believe, I need to live it. Running for office is living what I believe. I believe in individual liberty rather than government central control. I believe in protecting life rather than destroying it. I believe in individual choice rather than government monopoly. Those are things that I truly believe, and I wasn't going to sit back. I was going to do something about it. And so I ran for office against a very strong incumbent, and amazingly, I won. That is amazing. And we have a picture up here of, uh, of, of your family, I believe. Is this? Oh, uh, yeah. We got uh, this sent to us earlier. And so can you just introduce us uh, to your uh, children there? Uh, well, uh, on, on the right is my son, Justin. In the middle is my oldest daughter, Kristen. And uh, on the left there is my daughter, Catherine. Beautiful. Uh, Justin and Kristen are twins. And which was the one who was uh, riding the bike with one <laughs> finger? <laughs> we keep my, old, my, old, my oldest. The oldest one. Yeah. Yeah, it's always yeah, the I, oldest I tell stories on it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> it's always the oldest that tend to be the, the most rebellious. We were actually at a family get together with my brothers and sisters and parents. And we were, I'm the oldest of seven. Okay. And uh, we were talking about how parenting changes yes, it through does. the progression yes. of life. and. I pointed to my parents that they were by far the most strict with me. Yeah. I had the curfews. I got yes. grounded all the time. And, and they were like, well, you were the most rebellious yeah. one, too. So. All right. Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe that, uh, maybe that had something to do with it. But, well, that's, that's a fascinating story. Um, if you could do it all over again, would you still have run in 2010? I would have. Yeah, I would. I would run again. Uh, it is a tremendous amount of work. I don't think... I realized how much work it would be. Um, the hours are very long, but it is worth it. It is so important that uh, we have strong conservatives in the legislature. And uh, one of the questions that I've been asked most frequently mm -hmm. since uh, Marty selected me mm -hmm. as his lieutenant governor candidate is why would you walk away from basically a safe seat? You know, I, I won it with 54% in a really bad year for Republicans. Mm -hmm. uh, why, would I, what, why would I do that? Mm -hmm. And um, in my first term, we had the majority in both the House and the Senate. And I learned how powerless we were to... Um, to enact true reform. We would pass incredible stuff, bills, in the House and the Senate, and then it would go to the governor and he'd veto it. Uh, there were times where even the Star Tribune was supporting our initiatives, and still the governor would veto it. Uh, so uh, when Marty called on me, uh, he had that belief in me and wanted my uh, uh, help and to be his running mate, I, I said yes. Dallas, if we could pop up uh, this picture here of Representative Myra and Marty Seifert there. Uh, that's the team yeah. uh, running in 2014 to be the next Minnesota governor's administration. Mm -hmm. And uh, did you expect Marty to, to ask you to, to take on such a high seat in the, in the state of Minnesota? Or were you surprised or did you well, just look at this as, as the next chapter in P Pam Myra's life? You know, I have um, been asked over the last year, well, are you going to do something else? And um, I would answer, and, and many people, even an editor of a, uh, of a, a news outlet asked me, well, aren't you going to do something else? You know, or aren't you going for higher office? And I finally came to the conclusion I was, I, I was comfortable where I was at. And uh, the day that Marty asked if, if I would be willing to be on his list of, of potential candidates, I, I, I got a tear in my eye. It was, it was kind of, um, I was, it was surprising. It was amazing. That so is that, would, is that how it would works have, then? They, they, there's like a, a list that they, the governor's candidates compile of potential running mates? Well, that's, uh, that's what Marty did. That's what he did? That's what he did. He, uh, he asked if I would be uh, willing to be considered, mm -hmm. and he gave me a week to think about it. I, I think I took a day and called him back and said, 
thank you for the honor and yes please you know put me on your list and uh, then it was uh, a while before I heard back and and was interviewed by his campaign um, committee as chair and uh, and then a couple days later he met uh, with me and and asked me if I would uh, be his running mate and I said yes that's pretty amazing and we had uh, Marty Seifert on the show how oh, is a uh, probably four or five months ago okay. when, he, when he first started All his right. campaign and a number of people had already entered the race at this yes. point and and then Marty uh, went in and what I truly admire about the man is you know, he ran for the endorsement in 2010 yes. uh, he didn't earn it Tom Emmer did mm -hmm. uh, Marty right away supported the Emmer's campaign told yes. his followers you know at the convention that they should all get behind yes. Tom Emmer he was a true classy gentleman, gentleman. Yes, about, about absolutely. the whole thing and and here he is he spent some time in, in the private sector doing yeah. some things with real estate and I think some other things and and here he is again running four years mm -hmm. later for the same seat and, and I happen to admire that type of perseverance and commitment mm -hmm. and to me it really shows that this is something that he feels called to do and it's something that uh, he wants to do and it's something that he's committed to doing um, you know there's as I stated a number of candidates running for the the governor's endorsement and I believe your your campaign you guys have said that no matter what you're running to the primary you're going for the endorsement but you're still yes. going to continue to run in the primary can you comment on uh, uh, the other campaigns out there and, and where you guys fit in into the mix well I'm going to say first of all I really believe in Marty I think he's going to win the endorsement I think he's going to win the primary I think he's going to the general election I really do um, last December I had my campaign kickoff and I invited all six uh, gubernatorial candidates and Marty was the only one who said he was going to be there and came and he spent the entire night investing in my supporters and the grassroots people of my house district. Uh, there was um, another individual who told me at the last minute he was going to be there but he didn't show. Another individual said uh, he couldn't make it, but then he came for a few minutes. But Marty was the only one who invested that much time. And that's what I've seen uh, in him uh, in these last number of months, is he has been working tirelessly, tirelessly to earn the, um, uh, the support of the uh, grassroots people, the delegates and alternates. He's making phone calls, he's meeting with people all across the state. Uh, as far as uh, there's a number of other candidates who had said early on that they were going to go on to the primary, and uh, Marty sees that as, as something is going to necessarily have to do, mm -hmm. have to go back on. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so when is the endorsement? The endorsement is Saturday, May 31st. Okay, so that's the, coming up yeah, here this, then. Yeah, very soon, yeah. The, the state convention is that weekend. Uh, Thursday night is State Central. Uh, for those delegates and alternates, people will be going down there early. Uh, Friday is an important day for U.S. Uh, Senate uh, endorsement. Mm -hmm. And then I understand first thing on Saturday, the 31st, we'll I'll be hitting the endorsement for gubernator a gubernatorial candidate. Oh, so, that, so that's how it's going to work then, is Friday is the, the U.S. Senate endorsement, yes. and then yes. Saturday is for the governor. Yes. Uh, one of the things that have come up, and, and Marty and I, we talked about this, um, you know, there's this, uh, I don't know if it's more of a mythical type thing, but people talk about the bad blood between the Emmer and the Seifert campaign. Uh, you know, as I stated, when, when Tom Emmer was endorsed, Marty supported his campaign right away, mm -hmm. told all his followers that they need to support Emmer. And then he had a whole bunch of uh, activities that he had to do to take care of his family and work sure. in the private sector and, and do those types of things over the, the last four years. But can you comment on, is the emmer Seifert rivalry, is it still there? Or do you think that... Um, well, I don't, I, I haven't seen it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just thought that uh, Marty was such a class act. Mm -hmm. on how he uh, conducted himself mm -hmm. at the state convention four years ago. I was amazed. Um, uh, going for, and I think we had three or four ballots, uh, and he bowed out and threw his support uh, to Tom. Uh, I thought that was very, very impressive, uh, a man of character. Um, I am unaware of, of bad blood, so can't really comment on it. So you mentioned that, so you were elected in 2010, and you, yes. you mentioned a few of the, the bills that you were proud that you yes. were the primary author on. Can you expand a little more about what specifically these bills were and, and sure. how those policies are taking effect today? 
sure. In my, in my very first year, I had a literacy bill. Of course, that's really dear mm. to my heart and will always be. Um, there was um, a number of provisions in there. In the end, uh, just a few of them were included in the education omnibus bill, which I, I was grateful for. Uh, and in fact, recently, uh, the, both the governor and uh, the education commissioner commented on, on those provisions. Uh, so that's great. Uh, the two bills in 2012 that I mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. one was a transparency bill. Uh, there was a situation in my house district where uh, an HR director was let go uh, from the school district, and she was paid over a quarter of a million dollars. Wow. Yeah, wow. <laughs> you know, I mean, as a parent and as a taxpayer, I really want those funds to be going toward educating our children. And here, uh, this money was spent to have her walk away from her job. Uh, the public- 250000 More. More than that. Yes, mm. yeah. Yeah, and uh, so there was a huge public outcry, uh, both from parents and from taxpayers in my community. Mm -hmm. And uh, they went to the school board and wanted answers. And the school board said, we can't give you answer answers. These, this information is private data. And uh, so that opened up an opportunity uh, to uh, revise current statute. Statute had been that um, very high level public officials um, would have information released on why there would be these payouts. But for that middle uh, level of public officials, that information was private. And so with the situation, uh, with negotiating across uh, the aisle, uh, we were able to uh, get um, that bill passed. It passed unanimously in the House. It wasn't quite unanimous in the Senate, but the governor signed it. And it was a reform that uh, had been uh, sought after for over 17 years by advocates of, of transparency. So very pleased with that. In uh, 2013, we came back and worked on that bill again, mm -hmm. uh, tweaked it a little bit. Sometimes there's unintended consequences. Sometimes there's loopholes that appear, and that happened with that bill. And so we were able to uh, revise the language, tighten it up, clarify it, and it passed again unanimously. So very pleased about that. Uh, the, the other bill uh, in my in my uh, first term was a digital learning bill. I had the opportunity to learn about the, the potential of digital learning in our classrooms, and it was just exciting uh, to see how um, th that could really be a, a really a turning point for education. And I, I'm not a techie at all. In <laughs> fact, uh, I homeschooled my children, and um, I didn't let them use calculators or the computers mm. uh, for uh, school until mm -hmm. they were in high school. Mm -hmm. I really wanted them to un truly understand. And that used to be the norm. When right. I was going, growing right. up, right. that's what we did. Yeah, 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 back, back in back those in days. Back in the day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when they used to drive around so, horse so, buggies now. Yeah, I, you know, so, so here I'm learning about digital learning. I'm so impressed. I'm not a techie. I'm thinking, if I can be swayed, anybody can be swayed. And so I uh, uh, went and uh, wrote a bill on digital learning. Um, there were at least three aspects of it uh, that I, I wanted. I ended up having to relinquish one of them just to get it passed. Um, it, it wasn't passing the Senate. It passed in the House uh, with overwhelming numbers with all my provisions. I, I think it was like uh, 96 to something. Uh, so it had a lot of support in the House. Uh, the Senate uh, was having heartburn over it for some reason. But I took out one provision, but the rest uh, passed and uh, uh, very excited about that. Uh, it, it had. Um, um, definitions uh, for digital learning, blended learning. It uh, allowed for additional uh, preparation for teachers. Uh, in fact, uh, it received national attention. I was asked to be a, a guest speaker at a national convention in Washington, D.C. to speak on that bill. That's so, incredible. Yeah, it was very exciting. So you, it was very exciting for a freshman yes. uh, legislator to be able to do that. So It's yeah. a remarkable achievement. And, you know, so when you were elected, you, Republicans were in the majority. Yes. And then when you were reelected, uh, we lost the majority. Yes. Republicans lost the majority. Yeah. Um, you were still able to get bills passed with strong bipartisan support. And in this era where so many people are... Uh, at least seemingly, uh, uh, you know, voters complaining about the divisiveness of mm -hmm. politics and, and this whole R versus D mentality. Um, can you give uh, the viewers of this show a, a, just like a window into it? Is the legislature, is it really as partisan as the media makes it out to be? 
There are some people who are. I try not to be, quite honestly. I, I look for the ultimate goal. I, I really want children to learn how to read. Mm -hmm. I want them to succeed. Those are really important things to me. And how, how can we accomplish that? And um, I have just really thrown myself into studying uh, what makes sense, what works, what doesn't work, what research shows that it simply doesn't work. Um, there's been times where I've been on the floor of the house and I've had uh, DFL com members come over to me and say, uh, Pam, I really support what you're doing. I agree with you, but I'm, I'm voting with my party. Mm. I just wanted you to know, mm. you know, and it's like, well, please don't, you know, if you believe the same thing, yeah. you know, support me here, please. Yeah. Uh, but there have been other bills where I have uh, had unanimous support. And uh, uh, on that digital learning bill, it went through education policy, then it went to education finance, and we were in majority. I, we could have pushed it through, but actually it was a, a Republican member who was having heartburn about it. And he caught me um, in one of the halls and said, you know, I'm really having heartburn over this. I, I'm going to shoot it down if you bring it up on the floor. And I said, well, you know, can we meet? And so uh, we met and uh, we went, his concerns were a part of the bill that it, it wasn't on my top part of the, my mm -hmm. priorities. Mm -hmm. And so we were able to fix that. Hmm. And he said, well, uh, how about we include this uh, DFL member and this DFL member? In the end, I had three uh, Republican uh, co-authors and three Democrat co-authors. And uh, they both sp spoke up on the floor in support of my bill. Uh, but after... Um, after that uh, individual caught me in the hall, my, my bill was on the general register. It was ready to go. I could have pushed it and said, no, you know, uh, it will pass without your, you know, your support. Uh, but instead, I asked to have it taken back to education policy. We revised it, amended it in committee, and then we took it back to education finance, revised it. Everybody was on board. We met, uh, all the co-authors and I met uh, some stakeholders, we met together, and then when we went to the floor, uh, you know, we, we had overwhelming support. Uh, I think at that point, it was in the 90s, um, after um, conference committee, it was 100% wow. unanimous support. One of the promises that Governor Dayton made is that he said he would not sign into law any bills that didn't have strong bipartisan support. And my question is twofold, has he lived up to that promise? And then secondly, if the Seifert Myra administration is elected in 2014, how are you going to deal with uh, those same types of issues? Are you only going to sign into law bills that have strong bipartisan support? Excellent question. No, the governor has not lived up to that. I mean, the bullying bill is certainly one e example of that, anti-bullying bill. I think it's a bullying bill. Um, there was no Republican support for that uh, in either house. And uh, I mean, it's a bad Not a single vote? Uh, my understanding, not a single vote. There were Democrats who voted against it. Mm -hmm. um, none of us, none of us want bullying. I, I truly understand bullying firsthand. Mm -hmm. I was both physically and verbally abused in those horrific four years of my life, first through fourth grade, until I learned to read. I would actually um, figure out alternative ways to walk home so I could avoid those bullies. I would linger at school until everyone was gone. I understand the issue. Uh, the bullying bill that went through, the anti-bullying bill that went through, is not going to solve that problem. One, it, it had a problem with um, the issue of um, it wasn't protecting everybody. It only uh, protected special classes. It allows for anonymous reporting. And uh, it doesn't clearly require parental notification. These are really, really serious problems. Mm -hmm. There's not a single person on the floor of the House or the Senate who wants a child to be bullied. But the, uh, the way that bill went through, it's actually going to increase bullying as far as I'm concerned. Um, the governor signed it. Uh, yeah. As, as far as uh, um, uh, the Seifert administration and signing different bills, um, you know, I, I'm not going to speak on behalf of Marty. There are times that um, parties dig in their heels. And so um, 
like that lady, the, the, the member who came over and said, Representative Myra, I, I support uh, this particular bill, but I'm going to vote with my party. Um, there may be th things that we really need reforms, we, uh, or a particular uh, omnibus bill needs to be passed, and uh, there's no way that they're going to give us support. You know, sometimes it is very partisan on the floor. How does it work with the relationship between the, the governor and the lieutenant governor when you're in your candidacy and there's differences? Because you can't possibly believe 100% uh, and have 100% consistency in your stance yeah. and, and Marty Seifert's stance. So how I is that remedied and then how does that factor into the decisions that you would make separately with the campaign mm -hmm. or if, if you are elected? Mm -hmm. Well, starting last summer, I was asking gubernatorial candidates questions. What is your stance on this particular issue? What's your stance on this? Uh, had a number of times I, I, I talked with Marty, even before he announced his candidacy. Uh, and then after, um, yeah, what do you think about this issue? You know, I was trying to decide which gubernatorial candidate to support. I hadn't, I hadn't declared who I was going to be supporting. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was amazed how much in agreement we are. Uh, we're both very strong conservatives. Uh, we stand for the, the uh, Constitution. Uh, we are wanting to protect our liberties and our rights. And um, actually, in all the numerous conversations we had, we came up with only one issue that um, we did agree on. Um, but, um, you know, in the spectrum, it's, you know, it's probably we were in agreement on 99.5 percent of, of the issues. Mm. Um, I have quite honestly been been honored how um, Marty has treated me and his uh, the campaign has treated me, uh, accepting my advice and my ideas. Uh, um, the uh, level of respect I have for Marty is tremendous, and um, I have appreciated the uh, level of respect he has shown toward me. Yeah, he's run a, a fantastic campaign so yes. far. And from yeah. what I hear from, you know, I have friends, a lot of friends that yeah. are Democrats and friends that are independents, and one thing they do say about Marty Seifert is they look at him as a leader and yes. as a statesman. Yes. Uh, he doesn't, he chooses his words carefully. He, mm -hmm. He's not a divisive figure. Um, mm -hmm. He's somebody who, who, who's really trying to bring together this diverse state yes. and moving us uh, into like, a, a, you know, yeah. stronger economy and, and more jobs and, and I, better I schools. And, and I wholeheartedly agree. Yeah, and he definitely has that. And that, you know, I just wanted to touch on a couple hot button issues. Okay. So if I could just briefly ask you, so everybody knows kind of sure. where you and the uh, Seifert administration would stand if you were elected. Uh, these are some of the the big ones that people have been talking about. Sure. You read about in the papers or see on KSDP or other areas. But the first one, medicinal marijuana. Medical marijuana. Okay. Um, how many minutes do I have? <laughs> Actually, the issue is, is very serious, and the, um, these epileptic seizures, this very rare disease that mm -hmm. these young children are experiencing, mm -hmm. is very sorrowful. Um, there is a program with the FDA called the Investigational New Drug Program. Mm. Uh, it is a program that allows them to get free uh, medicine. Um, I understand that this condition is is very rare. I am extremely concerned about uh, youth. I serve as a le legislative liaison to the Minnesota Youth Council. The beginning of March, they released uh, a, a video uh, movie called uh, The State of Using, and it talks about uh, primarily marijuana, substance abuse mm. among our youth. I am very concerned about uh, what uh, legalizing marijuana, uh, medical marijuana, will do. Uh, the Columbia University researchers came out uh, after reviewing information, and uh, their research shows that in states that have medical marijuana, uh, substance abuse is uh, almost twice as much as in those states that don't have medical marijuana. I am very, very concerned about the impact on youth. I understand that uh, law, the law enforcement coalition uh, has been in opposition to this, uh, as well as um, the medical community uh, has been calling for more research. And uh, I, I am concerned about uh, giving uh, a, a substance uh, to children that has not been tested 
and the dosage and all of that. There, I, there's a lot of uh, serious concerns, but um, I am encouraged by the uh, potential of having the uh, investigational new drug program here in Minnesota. Second, uh, hot button issue that a lot, it's gotten a lot of press. Mm -hmm. I know Joe Sutre has written about it and others. Uh, the Minnesota Senate building, is, is this something that is now going to be built, uh, the, the new building, the $80 million building for the Minnesota State Senators? And, and what is your position on that? Um, I thought it was closer to $90 million, um, and we certainly are opposing it. I, I thought that uh, the DFL putting it into the tax bill last year was uh, egregious. Um, both Marty and I are, are in opposition uh, to the building of the uh, Senate office building. I believe it's uh, uh, palatial and, and uh, ridiculous. Um, as far as its status, I understood that uh, there was an agreement made between the Senate and and the House, the the House would pass the uh, anti-bullying bill, if uh, because the Senate wanted their new new home. Mm -hmm. so. And you know that was the next issue. We've already touched on it a little bit. Was the the anti-bullying anti bill that that took place? And I actually stayed up uh, one night and watched the House debate when okay. they ended up passing it. Yes. And one thing that struck me over and over again is, is proponents of this anti-bullying legislation. They said over and over how they absolutely trusted the local school districts to uh, come up with their policies to uh, combat bullying and to deal with this yes. this real problem as you pointed out um, but then the question is well why would we need a, right. a state top-down approach dictating that the local districts need to do this if there was so much trust in their ability to, to deal with the bullying issue. But so your official stance is you're against the anti-bullying bill that was passed. What could be done to uh, combat bullying in, in your opinion? Well, I think it needs to be understood by people that our school districts and uh, parents in general were not asking for a change. Minnesota already had statute. It was brief and concise. There's nothing wrong with concise language in statute. Um, I called around to uh, the superintendents in my house district and asked, um, what do you think? What, I just asked a general question, what do you think? How's it going? You know, on the whole broad spectrum of things. One of my superintendents said the number one concern, number one concern she had was this anti-bullying bill. Uh, the additional red tape. She said, we are already doing it well. Mm. We don't need this. This is, uh, this is overreach. And uh, another one of my superintendents didn't want to make a comment. But th this anti-bullying bill um, really uh, was not from the constituents up. Hmm. Next issue is uh, Mincher. Mincher. A number of the governor's candidates, they've said, you know, there's different proposals on the table. Some people have said that we should scrap Mincher and go into the federal exchange. Some people said we should scrap the website and construct a whole new website for Mincher. Uh, you know, what is, the, what is your official position on Mincher and what are we going to do with health care in Minnesota uh, moving forward if you are elected? Mincher has been a disaster. The enrollment numbers ha have been a disaster. Uh, the um, the s uh, omnibus supplemental uh, appropriations bill has a huge amount of money in the tails in the out years. Almost, uh, I think it's $900 million to make up for um, Obamacare um, mandates and uh, it, it, a lot of problems. Health care needs to be returned to the hands of people rather than having a government monopoly here. Uh, tax credits, more options for people, uh, less mandates. Mining in Mining. northern Minnesota, yes or no? Yes. Responsibly. Responsibly. What are the studies showing? Uh, you know, My understanding, the studies are showing that actually uh, it can be done responsibly so that uh, wa water quality is even higher than what we have now. And the last issue I wanted to talk to you about, next week we're actually, we're going to have a debate with Fair Vote Minnesota, who, this is an organization that's in favor of national popular vote. Mm. And then we have uh, somebody who's going to be debating okay. against 
the national popular vote. And if you guys don't have a, a position on this, then you, you just let us know. But okay. does the, the Seifert Myra administration, do you guys have a position on national popular yes, vote? Yes, we do. Yes, uh, we're opposed to national popular vote. Why should we relinquish our electors to uh, be, be decided by somebody else, by uh, voters in another state? No, we, we need to have, uh, uh, we need to continue on the way we are. I, I, the, one of the big arguments that is made for national popular vote is it will uh, bring candidates here uh, to, uh, to campaign in our state. And we'll, I, I think the absolute opposite will happen. They, they will, will, will fly over us even more. So my last question, and we kind of went over our time here, and I apologize okay. for that because I know you're busy and you got to right. get to other places here. It's been but, fun. Uh, it has been fun. Yeah, thank you for for being on. And you know, we like to, you know, Governor Dayton. Uh, some people love him, some people don't like him, but uh, but on this show, we really like to give people their due respect, and that, that's Absolutely. something that you pointed out. That's um, something that I think is a Minnesotan value: is, is to respect one another, to respect differing viewpoints and he can't be you know his policies can't be all bad so I was wondering if you could um, highlight one thing or something that the Dayton administration has done that you find admirable and then also if you can contrast that with some things that uh, your administration would do differently if you were elected in 2014 well that is a tough question <laughs> um, there's, there's a lot of things that um, I, I respect the man, um, but there's a lot of policies that I, I am not in favor of. I mean, the, uh, the tax increases of, of the last uh, session, uh, $2.1 billion on the people of Minnesota. Uh, I guess I could say I am thankful so thankful that uh, the DFL uh, saw the real problem and the hardship that was being caused to uh, Minnesota businesses mm -hmm. by uh, repealing uh, those business-to-business -business taxes. I, I am so thankful that he signed uh, that repeal into law. Very grateful for that. So, And uh, what, what's far, the biggest difference that Minnesotans would notice from your administration uh, versus the current administration? I think it's a philosophical difference between uh, Republicans and Democrats. Republicans, we want individual liberty. We want choices for individuals. Uh, uh, Democrats, uh, particularly, want more government control, uh, government uh, and bureaucrats to make decisions. I think that's the key difference. Sounds good. Well, Representative Myra, thank you, well, thank so, you much so much for uh, being on the show. And can you just let everyone know in the last uh, 20 seconds here how they can find out more about the Cypher campaign and the website and everything? Cypherforgovernor.com. Cypherforgovernor.com. Yes. Everybody should go there and yes. check it out and find and out. And we're on Facebook as well. So, very Great. good. Well, thank, thank you so much for coming thank on the show. Thank you so much, Tony. I appreciate that. That's Representative Pam Myra. We are honored to have her on the show. She's Lieutenant Governor candidate running with Marty Seifert. The Republican State Convention is coming up at the end of May here. Uh, they're, they're going to endorse the candidate and then the primary is coming up. I believe that date is, is August 12th is when the primary is gonna happen. And then of course, November 4th is the general election. Again, that uh, website was seiffertforgovernor.com. And I uh, encourage everybody to go to the website, learn more about Marty Seifert, learn more about Representative Pam Myra, really dig yourself in on the issues. I've talked to some people at work uh, lately who uh, they've described themselves as apolitical and they've typically have pulled the lever for Democrats. And really it's been over the last four years uh, as some of these new policies have come about like uh, the disastrous Minsher, uh, some of these uh, other overreaches of the roles of government. And it's, it's opened people's eyes. And, and I was talking to a gal that I work with, a young gal, and, and she said, Tony, this is the first year that I'm going to really dig in and do my research on these policies. She said, I thought I was a Democrat. I've always voted Democrat. And I thought they stood for this. And then she's finding out that through these policies that they don't coincide or they're not consistent with what it is that the party says it is that they stand for. And so that's why it's so important for you, the viewers, to get out there and go on these websites, call the candidates up, send them emails, find out more about that. So uh, with that,